My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make metal melody, awake my soul. Good morning and welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church. We are glad that you have joined us online. Please comment and let us know that you are in community with us this day and share any joys or concerns so that we might be in prayer with one another. A few announcements that I would like to share with you all is that Kids Club and Youth Group will be meeting this evening as our quarantine has ended and that we will be able to return to normal activities. Also, our session will be meeting together in person Monday evening, tomorrow at 6 p.m. And then also we will resume our Wednesday evening Bible study 530 in person in the sanctuary or online via Zoom. With these things in mind, let us continue our worship this day. Please join me in the call to worship. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit. Let us worship God together.
Legends God's bow has been hung in the clouds, a unilateral disarmament in spite of our sin. God remains faithful to the covenant of steadfast love, even when we are unfaithful. Without fear, then, we confess our sins. Let us lift our heart up to the Lord in prayer. God of mercy, we begin this Lenten season in confession. We do not live according to your ways, but according to our own. We condone violence, participate in systems of injustice, and use power to our own advantage at the expense of others. Forgive us, we pray, when we are tempted to follow paths other than those you set before us. Teach us your commandments. Help us to turn from evil in its many gauzes and turn us toward your kingdom drawing near. In covenantal love, remember us, we pray, and before us once more and always an ark of safety and new life. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. As Noah and his family were brought safely through the flood onto dry ground, so in baptismal waters we are brought from death into new life in Christ. Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, forgives us and reconciles us in all things, in heaven and on earth. Thanks be to God for this good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, in rushing waters and in dry wilderness, in every season and circumstance, we need your sustaining word. By the power of your Holy Spirit, proclaim the good news among us today, so we may repent and believe and see anew how the time is fulfilled and the kingdom has come near. In Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, we pray. Amen.
Our first scripture reading this morning comes to us from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22. Let us hear God's word for us this day. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. In baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels and authorities and powers made subject to him. Amen. Our second scripture reading this morning comes to us from Genesis. Genesis chapter 8. Excuse me, Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 19, 17. Let us continue to hear God's word for us this day. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every, every living creature that is with you the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many come out of the ark. I will establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant I will make with you, between me and you, and every living creature that is with you. For all future generations, I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of the all flesh. And the waters shall never be again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Sydney and I moved to North Carolina, one of the first things we had to do was get our North Carolina driver's license. One of the steps required for this process was to take the signs test. I hadn't had to test my knowledge of road signs since I was 16. Needless to say, I was more confident than I should have been. I was unaware that the signs test would remove portions of the signs, including words, colors, symbols, and their context. I should not have passed my signs test that day, but thankfully the DMV worker was feeling gracious. As she put the signs in their context, I was able to correctly identify all the signs and pass. There are signs apart from those that we come across on the road that are recognizable. When we see big, dark, puffy clouds forming in the west, we know that more than likely we will have a thunderstorm. When we feel the wind change and hear the rustle of the leaves and the trees, we can read the sign that a cold front is pushing through. When we see the sign of smoke, we know that there is fire. One of my favorites is the sign of the rainbow. For those of us who grew up in the church, this sign instantly reminds us of the story of Noah's Ark. I find it providential that our focus passage for the first Sunday in Lent happens to be about Noah and the covenant that God made with him, especially considering the amount of rain we've had this month. 
I even told Sydney and the boys and put on Facebook one of my favorite jokes. Need an ark? Well, I know a guy. Our passage from Genesis is an account of the covenant made between God, Noah, and all of creation. The covenant itself was promissory, meaning that God pledged to never again use water to flood and destroy the world and its inhabitants. Unlike other covenantal agreements made between God and God's people, the covenants made with Abraham, Moses, and the Israelites, this covenant was a unilateral decision. Usually, covenants require actions between both parties involved or at the bare minimum, require a change initiated by humankind. But here in this covenant, between God and Noah, in all of creation, obligations were placed solely on one covenantal partner. Professor of Biblical Studies Diane Bergent wrote in her commentary, What made this pact so unusual is the fact that God was bound by it, but the human members were not. God promised to refrain from future destructive activity, but the other covenant partners were not required to adhere to any specific norms. The character of this covenant demonstrates divine compassion and magnanimity. When looking at the covenantal agreement between God and Noah and all of creation, I find it helpful to look back at the beginning of Genesis so we might better understand how we got to where we are today. In the beginning, God created order out of chaos. God stilled the wild waters and made them calm, separating them from the dry land. God made every living thing, And then God made humans in God's own image, and God saw that it was very good. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve reintroduced chaos into God's created order by eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. From the Garden, we have more stories of sin and chaos, starting with Cain and Abel. So much so, where God sees God's own creation and says, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But God saw a righteous man named Noah and came up with a new plan. This week, Sydney and I received word that a friend and member of our former congregation has entered hospice care and is near death. He was one of those members that if the door to the church was open, you would find him there. He loves his church family. He loves us. And his church family loves him. Somehow, some way, it didn't matter what the topic was for Sunday school or men's Bible study. He would always find a way to quote the prophet Malachi, For I, the Lord, do not change. I would often push back on him, challenging him to look at the whole of Scripture and see the moments we learn and know that God did, in fact, change. I was reminded of these debates and disputes together this week. When studying this passage from Genesis, the story of the flood and Noah's ark is one example of God having a change in heart. Dr. William Lloyd Allen wrote in his commentary, The God revealed here is adaptable, touched to the heart by creation, and willing to accept hurt to keep hope alive. Often, Christian redemption is associated with mutable humanity fitting itself into immutable God. The God of this covenant is unchanging only in refusing to give up on creation. 
God keeps the future open by self-limitation when humanity threatens to close off hope by unlimited repeat offenses. God takes this risk because God's heart is touched by creation's suffering. This covenant with Noah and all of creation is a stopgap measure. Though creation is granted a reprieve, God's purpose for a unified, harmonious cosmos remains in conflict with humanity's corrupting influence. Lent, the season of Lent, recognizes this imbalance, giving us a means to seek restoration by embracing our sin and mortality. The story of Noah and God's rainbow covenant was written for the people of Israel in the midst of exile from their homelands, in the midst of chaos and destruction. We are no strangers to chaos, as so many parts of our lives have been chaotic and hard over the last year. We know chaos when life is disrupted by acts of terrorism, war, pandemics, and natural disaster. We know chaos on a more personal level when we lose loved ones to death, experience broken relationships, divorce, loss of jobs, illness, and addictions of all kinds. Preacher and biblical storyteller, the Reverend Jane Ann Ferguson, wrote in her commentary, Much of this chaos we bring on ourselves through our resistance to God's ways. To see and know God as the one who remembers us, corporately and individually, with love and forgiveness in the midst of life's chaos, with all its pain and suffering, is to discover redemption. Hearing this story on the first Sunday in Lent, we begin our walk with Jesus toward Jerusalem understanding in a deeper, fuller way the God who sent him and whom he served. Beloved, as we continue our journey through the Lenten season, may we be awakened to the ways God's redemptive work is happening in our lives now. May we see the signs of God's redemptive love all around us, within us, and among us, as we journey together toward Jerusalem. Amen. Friends, let us now affirm our faith using the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us lift our hearts up to the Lord in prayer. Steadfast God, thank you for sheltering us in the storms of life. Thank you for ministering to us through angels, seen and unseen, in times that test us. Thank you for claiming us as a people beloved forever. Because of your great love and care for us, we trust in our brightest joys and deepest needs. We rejoice when dark clouds of trouble are overtaken by the light of your presence and new possibilities. When things settle down after a time of tossing about, when the great storm is over, 
and when the promise of resurrection life takes hold in us with sure and certain hope. Hear our prayers, we ask, for the deep needs of the world. In places of violence, in warfare, give us the courage to lay down our weapons of death and promote life and well-being instead. In places of drought and fire, bring rain that make the earth colorful and verdant again. In places where the waters overtake their boundaries, allow the overflowing chaos to recede. Loving God, in life and in death, we belong to you. So in the midst of life, we entrust ourselves to your care. We are bold to ask for help when we are confused, lost, or afraid. We are eager to ask for healing for our bodies and minds, whether wounded, ill, or recovering. And we are uneas unceasing in our prayers for those we love who are far from us physically, emotionally, or spiritually. In the midst of death and grief, even though we are weary, we return again and again praying for comfort, for an easing of the pain that comes from loss, and for the light of your presence to pierce the present darkness. As the heavens were torn open at Jesus' baptism and the curtain in the temple was torn at his crucifixion, so now tear open anything that divides us from you or hides your presence in our lives or in the church. We desire to hear your voice of love, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and to see you clearly. Lead us to serve others faithfully as disciples of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray now together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, because we believe that in Jesus Christ, God's time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near, we respond in tangible ways by doing acts of justice and compassion and by sharing our resources. We bear witness to the good news of the gospel. The offering is received in gratitude to God.
beloved, as you go from this place, next time you see the sign of God's covenant hanging in the sky, when you see that rainbow, trust that you are enough, that God loves you, and God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Go living into the person that God created you to be. You are loved. You are claimed. And as you go from this place, go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the assurance of the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. Amen.